and welcome to the DM's Book Club, episode 13. I'm lucky for some. Um, this is a podcast where we read about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing campaigns. My name is Fiona and with me as ever, the, the ish to my mail, the uh, peanut to the butter. No, look, like, it, it's Ryan. <laughs> it's Ryan. I'm oh. sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, I realised the metaphor wasn't going very far. That was a metaphor. I have no idea what that was. That was... I mean, um, hi. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Frazzled. I'm I a little bit frazzled. Oh dear. Well, maybe some D and D will cheer you up. I get you back on the right path. Yeah, I, I am. I'm looking forward to this week because we kind of ended last episode saying there'll be something about Eberron, which is exciting, but we didn't say what. <laughs> Ryan, what's today's topic? What what are we what are we looking at? Well, you frequently tell me that my specialism of D and D is more of the vague world building stuff rather than the specific campaign material or encounter material or you know things that people can play straight out of the book. So I thought, hey, let's just dive into something and really dive into something that's totally different to what I would normally run, which is pre written low level material. Now, you actually introduced this to me a little while ago, and I never realized all this material was here on D&D Beyond, where every week, and specifically in the weeks that lead up to the releases of material books, so Eberron in this example, in the, I think it was like five or six weeks worth of stuff they put in before Eberron went up, they put in a little encounter of the week that runs uh, as a sort of little story narrative to get people excited about Eberron and specifically for these guys to get level one players into a world with some fun adventures that teaches the rules but isn't too difficult. So we're going to be going through the first two of these. The, the, the whole thing is called Around Corvair in 50 Days. Um, and then you've got the first two of those, which is Departure from Skyblock 6 or Sky Dock 6, I should say, Skyblock. Got my Minecraft is coming in there. <laughs> and Storm Over the Howling Peaks, is that? I, yes. I can't read my handwriting. Yes. This is a good start, isn't it? I'm looking through this and you see, I, I've actually done notes and everything. I'm looking at it and going, Whoa. Is, that, is that Howling Realms? No, <laughs> that's Howling Peaks. It is, of course, <laughs> Howling Peaks. <laughs> I guess give us a little bit of a background to Eberron. I know you've read a little bit of it, but like, what is what is Eberron? And what is this continent of, how did you pronounce it? Corvair? Is that how you Corvair. pronounce it? Corvair. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't, I, I, to be honest, I see a K and an H and I panic. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for Corvair and we're going to ride it out as if that's exactly how it's pronounced. I, I think that's, that's good. Idea. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So Eberron is a realm, an entire plane that, D&D has been put into. Now, Eberron's been around for quite some time. I think probably the first few editions of Dungeons & Dragons have had Eberron in some form, and specifically rising from the last war as, as like this sort of idea. Eberron is a realm of D&D where magic and sort of magic tech or technology that's, that's using magic as its base rather than science and, and as, as we would know technology has progressed to a level that is way beyond anything in a normal D&D realm. Eberron specifically aims to sort of peg itself at a mark about 1910 to 1920 in our sort of time frame, that sort of First World War, mm. the Great War sort of level. So we're talking rifles and muskets and basic radio communication and, and electricity and steam and all that sort of stuff without getting into anything involving computers or technology in, in, in that regard. That was kind of like 20 years later in, in sort of history. So that's where it pegs itself as. And Eberron is this big old set of continents of which the main one is called Corvair. Corvair suffered a vicious and bloody civil war, not even civil war, just a huge great war that lasted for a hundred years, killed untold amounts of people and sort of set everything into a state of chaos and and, and reduced, well, it kind of just put everyone back a few generations um, mm. and specifically ripped the continent up into different factions with different rogue states and areas like the Mornlands, which are these sort of horrible dead wastes. And it, it's sort of like an entirely different place to hold a D&D campaign. If you want something that's a little bit high tech, a little bit more futuristic, but at the same time still has that sort of lean on magic, everyone's a really good one. And actually looking in the encounters, there is a map of Corvair, 
which is beautiful. I think it's amazing. Like, and if, yeah, you, like you said, you've got all these other places that are eventually mentioned in this encounter. And yeah, it's just nice to see something that I've always been, I'm sure you're the same, Ryan. I've always been that sort of person that if there's a book in, if there's a book in a map, if there's a map in a book. Um, <laughs> if a book is inside a map, trying to read that book is very tricky. <laughs> It's just constantly, is it upside down? I don't know. Oh, um, man. Stuck in the rolls. If it's, it's like a roll-up map. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah, it's like, where's the appendix? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, anytime there's a fantasy book or, or a sort of history book, perhaps, but there's a map at the front and you go through it and it mentions places that are, you know, your, your protagonists go to, I always love, like, going to the front of it going, oh, they're there and they're going to go over here and stuff like that. And I just, there's just something magical about it. I think yeah. the, the other place that has it, um, I think Philip Pullman's Dark Materials also had something similar um as a map of some sort or at least the secret commonwealth did i think i must confess i actually have been put off entire series of fantasy books no. when their maps at the front of the books are bad or or, or, or lacking in some oh, okay. way right. me yeah, no, no, i'm not not dissing okay. oh, no, don't worry. It's, <laughs> it's a safe territory here we're we're, we're sanctified in how we do things no no it, i genuinely if the map at the front of the book is of low quality i can't get into it like mm. it's a really important part for me like I'm, I'm thinking back in the did you remember Sabriel the Garth Nix books oh my god that yeah um, um, I'm thinking all of the Robin Hobb books the maps some of them are really good and some of them are really bad and that used to peeve me when I was reading those and oh yeah all kinds of stuff but uh, yeah the, the map that comes with Eberron this is just a total diversion the map that comes with Eberron is a thing of beauty I love it it's great <laughs> Well, let's start right at the beginning. Like uh, again, I'm very excited because whilst you were saying, "Oh, you know, the vague world building," that was more of a compliment for me to you. But okay, we'll go into we'll go into written uh, modules. So, <laughs> what is the outline for this adventure? This entire encounter, this around Corvair and Fifty Days, is specifically designed to get people into Eberron and kind of into D and D in the first place. You are encouraged to bring a level one character in and you are thrown into a situation where this is kind of the start for a DM. This is kind of like a little, little learning curve for a DM as well because it kind of helps them into to this campaign. But it gets you vested and it throws you in and doesn't put you into a tavern. I was trying to think of the best way of putting that. There, there is this sort of joke with D&D that any campaign starts with characters meeting in a tavern. Mm -hmm. Like that's always what happens. This is not in a tavern. This is some way of a way of getting in and specifically the characters find themselves on the continent of Corvair in the region or, or, or city not even the, the country I would say called Breland Breland mm. Breland and the huge city of Shan now Shan is, is this huge metropolis of high tech and millions of people it is just the biggest skyscraperiest city that has ever hit dnd ever sean is just this big big place and you're in a tiny little place in upper jura which is kind of this middle class district and you meet the main protagonist of the campaign who is this angelica australia de silvis uh, again, butchering the pronunciation, but I think that's how I pronounced it, so it's fine. <laughs> okay. if, if that's how you do it, then that's cool for me. The gnome cartographer and explorer extraordinaire, and she has hired the party to attempt to, in a state of the art sort of prototype elemental ship, to sail around Corvair in 50 days and to essentially map the entire continent looking to see how it's changed in the 100 years that the entire continent was at war. And of course, as any good story, things are not necessarily all that they seem. And yeah, to go back to your point about, yeah, the, the joke of, you know, you all meet in a tavern. And it's, I find it really interesting because obviously when you're kids or when, when you have children playing D&D, &D, I think possibly one thing you don't want them to do is encourage maybe drinking or something like, oh, oh, well, <laughs> about that. well it's true. Like, cause like, I feel like, cause taverns and inns are like the information points. So if you're coming into a place, you go to the hotel or you go, you know, you know what, what do you do in real life? But then compare that to the adventuring world. But, uh, well, obviously we're going to go where there's food and bed. Mm. Oh, and there's drink. We'll go to the tavern. So it actually is quite nice to have an encounter, be able to bring people together, uh, complete strangers, I'd add as well, onto a, a mission. And I think that's what D&D, &D, most of the modules are starting to do now, I think, certainly with uh, Waterdeep, Dragon Heist, uh, you know, that, that sort of like, we're putting together a team and you don't have to know each other. You, you can have links to each other, but 
it gives you the option of like if you don't have any links that's okay you can build them as you go and mm-hmm. i found i found that really really interesting because there's uh, two ways you can go about it and I'll, I'll clang it again like improv they always say the scene is better if you already know the person yeah. and i think that's true but sometimes you just can't force a relationship you can't just happen to know everyone in this adventuring thing because then you'd already know their secrets you'd already know that oh they've got a shady past or oh they've got someone at home etc whereas at this it's just really nice because you you know you like it's you are being hired as mercenaries or for ship positions whatever and you can all bring mm-hmm. something different to the table well, that's exactly it. And and that's the thing. It gives everybody a totally blank slate to make a character in whatever way that they want to make them. So you, the only thing you have to, to sort of agree on or to have in your character's background is that you've been hired to escort this ship for 50 days. You'll be paid a, a stipend with food and lodgings included. And there's a bit of notoriety in it. That's all you're going to do. Your character is on this mission because they want to be on it. The rest of, of the character creation, the background, why they're there, how they're there, that's that's all up to you. And more importantly, at this point, it doesn't matter. There is a campaign and there are some things to do and you can build that story as you go along. And there's, there's often this sort of cliche that people will write pages and pages and pages and pages of backstory and they never get to use any of it. Whereas mm-hmm. the people who make things open and vague but compelling, those are the ones that really get to kind of explore it because there's more chance to adapt it to what's going on. I think that's really true in this case. Yeah, and uh, the sort of protagonist, like you said, this uh, Angelica figure, again, it is not necessarily as I would assume with quite a lot of the uh, sort of like maybe maybe previous starter adventures or previous uh, that they are like old adventurers or they are the town mayor or, or something, a figure of authority. Like she is still, she's still quite powerful, but actually her position isn't necessarily, or she doesn't have experience of fighting herself or so it seems. She actually is just a very excitable explorer. So I, for a long time, <laughs> I was reading this encounter i was just thinking of like nigel thornberry uh, i don't know i don't know if i would embody that uh whilst doing smashing. that yeah smashing but that's the thing right it's it's it gives you something that's it's someone who's passionate about something that's not necessarily combat oriented it's about someone that's passionate about geography they are very far a few between i think so i quite like that it's just something that's different and it's an escort mission where you know just make sure she's okay you don't have to go find goblins you don't have to go find where the missing family is you just put, yeah. putting taking her not point a to out, B. yeah you're not setting out to kill a dragon you're not plugging a hole to the abyss or solving an angels and demons like fight in some way you are literally going to explore and make some maps it's it's quite nice in a sort of weird way. And so the party starts. You all sign contracts in her office, effectively, agreeing to accompany the ship, the, the Celeste Noir, which I think is a fantastic name for a ship. Mm-hmm. And the campaign begins as you go to Sky Dock 6 and take off. And I will say as well, the artwork, and in all of d d Beyond's articles, I will say, but the one of the Celeste Noir is incredible. Do you want to just like describe the ship itself, Ryan? It's built as if it was a sailing ship in the most part. So it's got the regular sort of shaped hull. It's got the sort of the the aft and and the sort of raised deck at the back with a helm. It's got a couple of rudders, but the thing is obviously not built for the sea. It's built for the air and it is a sailing ship that literally can fly. And the way that it does this, it doesn't have sails particularly. It doesn't have like a a helium or hydrogen balloon. It doesn't have uh, turbines. It has what appears to be a sort of moon-shaped brass ring that sort of goes from the middle to the top to the middle to the back, so spanning behind it. So if you if, you, if it's going a long way across the ship, it sort of goes round into the back of it. And the thing lights up with flame. So it effectively <laughs> creates... Um, would you know what I meant by this sort of like life-saving rings that you get at the side of lakes and, and swimming pools, the bright orange things that you yes. throw in and one's drowning? Yeah, it, it looks like the ship is sealed through a giant one of those and then it kind of got stuck and is now following it like a halo but like a front-on halo that's burning and and blazing the thing looks ridiculously over the top and it's fantastic exactly i i like when i saw the image i was like that is quintessentially eberron you you know as soon as even in the description of shan itself like i because i was imagining sort of like almost like wizard of oz type things like there's so many people here it's it's amazing but also it's not that great you know again it talks 
about it being very, very rich and very, very poor, but obviously with this sort of steampunk S thing. And then you get to the ship and then you have a real sort of like, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore moments because <laughs> not only are you high up in the sky, but like the ship is huge and the way it operates is unlike anything else. Presumably the players who are playing level one characters, if they're not played an Eberron setting before, get to experience that. And I think that that's a, a real key point for me is like we're now flying you know and it's just yeah i absolutely love that idea so all right so we're about to get on the adventure we're on the ship we're setting off what happens next so the party make their way to the ship and promptly you meet the pilot demetrius Delandar. Uh, again, uh, this, this, some of the names in this are very tricky. So it's an interesting one, yes. It's an interesting one. Delandar. Again, the thing you need to know about the pilot and also about Angelica is that they are both dragon marked. And dragon marks are themes that run through the Eberron books. There are these magical tattoos marks i guess you'd describe them as that run genetically in families specifically families with very strict uh links with blood and, and they skip some generations but they don't skip others and both of them have a dragon mark and because of that they are very very powerful and rich would be the best way of putting it angelica's got a mark of scribing which essentially lets her naturally and inherently casts a lot of spells about communication and about navigation and and generally it, it's helped her in her cartography career demetrius has one it is essentially the mark of the storm and it allows him to pilot this ship and only he can pilot the ship it's quite an honor and it, it's sort of a, a way of making a bit of a monopoly of, of this sort of technology in eberron and again both of them will show you these marks but he as a pilot essentially just has been commissioned for this journey and he's going to fly it whilst Angelica basically tells them where they're going. The ship sets off. You leave uh, Sean behind you. You start your sort of anti-clockwise tour around the continent of Carver. And just like in any good starting campaign, you are attacked by three... Uh, now, again, the pronunciation is yes. the Kaleshta, I'm going to call them. Is yep. that how you get it? Kaleshta? Uh, Kal- Kaleshta. I, I was Kalashta. in my head, but again, I was waiting for you to say yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it's more of an ah. Uh, yeah, Kaleshta, and I like that. Yeah. Three thugs who are riding pterodons, which are these sort of flying dinosaurs that have been enlarged with potions of growth. It is a very different start to a campaign than you would normally think. You want a flying ship with a huge elemental ring of fire around it, and you get a Attacked by three Kalashtars riding flying dinosaurs. Mm. And you start your first combat encounter as they scream some sort of threat and dark secret against Angelica, implying some sort of deeper connection. And you have to fight them off. Like, out of all the names that are in the studio, I'm, like, I'm glad you said pterodons, because I was like going, mm. again, I was like, I'm glad I'm not pronouncing this. <laughs> I'm I just so bad. <laughs> I know it's terrible, isn't it? I just assumed it's a silent P, but I might be wrong. I think you're. I think you're right. Cause it's like pterodactyl. I know that yeah. one. That, that one's always obvious. And I was like, oh god, there's a P and a T. Uh. <laughs> when I was younger, I used to genuinely say pterodactyl. Like it was. Oh, it was, that's, yeah. that's adorable. <laughs> the sort of P at people. Yeah, and this is like you said, it is a really different start to an encounter because seeing pterodons. I mean, in general, you're like, okay dinosaurs are in this setting that's that's cool and i assume they were always in eberron setting i, I have to be honest i'm not too au fait with the uh, yes, history they are yes it's it's well <laughs> it's, it, again one of the things i like about eberron is just it sort of throws these random things at you but one of the areas and i believe it's the talenta plains there essentially is ruled and inhabited by halflings who are unlike the halflings from regular D, and they are these sort of feral nomadic clan halflings who have ownership and mastery of all of the local dinosaurs that live in the Talanta Plains. So they <laughs> ride on, on you know, raptors and, and these pterodons and have all of these horrendous... So, yeah, I love that. It's brilliant. And not only are they, you know, you're like, okay, they're dinosaurs, but they're big dinosaurs. And then you have these free riders of the, the Kalashtar, which we'll go on to in a little bit more detail. But they are actually quite... If you've not experienced this sort of, like, these races or, or these these sort of monsters in D D before soon you're like oh shit we could actually die and i think it's got to that point certainly with me when i see a group of goblins you're like typical D D. all right hack and slash one whereas this one because you're in the air they're flying they're going to do fly by attacks at you and you know they're, they're going to try you know until you sort of fend them off for a bit and then they flee screaming sort of insults it actually could be quite scary 
and yeah. again that sort of i don't know how likely it is or i even i didn't really check if the challenge rating was like a deadly encounter or not i assume not i assume like a hard but it's again it's that sort of thing where a couple of bad rolls and you could be laying out on the deck before you're about to set off into into your big adventure it, and it really is. And, and level one combat is always difficult at the best of times, let alone with flying enemies. But mm-hmm. these guys are all melee. They're all sort of easy enough and, and they will run away if you sort of push them too far effectively. So mm-hmm. it's, um, it, it's useful in that way. But yeah, you confront these people, you fight them off. And then at the end of this sort of little, little campaign or little module, I should say, you can then confront Angelica about what what's going on. Why is there a personalized attack? Why were they here for you specifically? And then providing there's a little bit of, you know, decent insight checks. All of these checks are good DC 10 checks. So they're pretty much flip a coin if your characters are, are unskilled in, in that sort of uh, thing. And, and as a DM, you've got liberty to let people re-roll if they ask different questions until they get a good, you know, mm. uh, roll out of it. But she gives some information uh, along the lines of the fact that she was not always a cartographer. Mm. Once upon a time, she used to be a sky pirate. What? And she saw the Kalashtar. Yes, exactly. Ooh. And now there is this gang of them called the Dream Raiders who want to kill her. And although she says she's changed her ways, there's more of the story you think that you haven't uncovered yet. So mm. yeah, it just sets it up to kind of open all these different little little hooks, get the players interested and wanting to come back. Yeah, and like the way it sort of talks about like how she goes, look, I'm sorry I have to keep some secret secrets, um, but if this is a deal breaker, I'll drop you off at the next port. Assuming that all the adventurers are like, all the players are like, no, we want to find out more. You know, that's the same. But it's, it is, feel, feels very almost like Long John Silver-esque. So like she suddenly is a person with a bit of a dark past, but it's, it's harmless. I just want to just want to map out this region. What else could there be? Oh no, she's a sky mm-hmm. pirate. I mean, again, I'll say this. I've not read the next couple of encounters, but in my head, I can't wait for her to be revealed as the captain of some dreadnought, like <laughs> big, big ship. And she goes, and here it is, <laughs> you know, and you've joined my yeah. crew you know that's what i want to see you happen a- astral there don't you mean just one of these horrible yeah, yeah. Just, just something like that yeah absolutely <laughs> but yeah yeah so there's this sort of little little hooks and it, it leads you quite nicely into the second chapter of it which is really i don't know i just like the, the fact that 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 entire campaign you could do it in half an hour if your if your party was really to the point or you could do it in three hours if you wanted to get into the talking and the role play and you've got inquisitive characters well, that's what I quite like about all the encounters of the week. If you go back and read quite a few of them, because I actually I have used one with you, Ryan. There was the one which is the sort of dying unicorn, which I changed slightly. And what what I like about all of these things, usually it is a setup for a scenario, and then there is usually there is a role play thing or a, a skill check or something that they have to do, and then there's a combat. And it just it's just such a simple structure. And like you said, you can just add as much detail in as you want, or you could just take it out. And depending on how quick your players are if they're really into their role play you could this whole section could could last you like a whole uh like if you were really struggling to think of it we're just going to do a quick one shot thing tonight we're just going to see how it goes and you've got it there you don't have to worry about too many skill checks or or any or anything that's in you know you need to get these right uh because if it's just a one-off you could just run this and it's completely fine yeah, exactly. And it's got enough hooks in it that if you then wanted to extrapolate from it, you could, and you could keep the story going. And th- exactly, this is this is the next encounter. So the next one is called Storm Over the Howling Peaks. Mm. Not, not, you know, peace or peace or whatever my handwriting said. Realms. Realms. <laughs> I, I don't know how I got a P into an R there, but there you go. It's terrible, <laughs> isn't it? So the yeah. party is on the ship. You fought away these Kalashtar on their flying pterodons. Pterodons. Whatever they're called. <laughs> and the Celeste Noir is continuing its journey, now heading towards the next place called Zalago. Mm. And as you hit a range of mountains, you see vicious storms overhead, these horrible black storms. Actually, the thing I like about this one is it gives you a lovely sort of paraphrase. You can you can have a go at reading to sort of set the scene. It talks about you know, the, the elemental ring humming and filling the air, the mm. eccentric gnome shouting bits and pieces, the crew leaping interaction. I'll let you read it. It's, it's um, something good to, to do. But the long and short of it is that you get told that the ship is approaching a storm and you're going to have to fly straight through it, prepare yourselves. And basically the party are asked, 
So what do you want to do to help? And so sort of begins what, a, what is, as you say, a big skill check where every single member of the party has to do something to help either the ship succeed, to go through the storm, to be able to batten themselves down or tie themselves to the deck, to do something useful. And they have to make a strength or dexterity check to effectively make that success or fail. And based on how many of them succeed, once the ship hits the storm, they all have to make a dexterity saving throw that deals a lot of damage if they've all failed and not very much damage at all if they've all succeeded with various sort of points in between, which I quite like. It gives everybody a chance to contribute in whatever they, they want, whatever useful way. And the DM is given liberty here to just say, look, if the party is doing something that seems like it's, it's going to help, mm. brilliant. It doesn't need to be written down. It's not a big table of like, oh, well, these are all the things that you could or couldn't do. Nah, just let them do whatever they want. And if it helps, brilliant. Yeah, there's um, there's a book, there's a series of books, which is like, oh, again, I can't remember the titles of them, but I, I can see one over there, and it's by Aaron Christensen. And he wrote up, like, his notes on his role-playing campaign, and he talked quite a lot about skill checks and how, like, in any RPG, you want to use skill checks to mean something, but... How do you use them effectively? And this is a really good example of what he was talking about. So being able to be like, okay, so you need to make the skill check. If you succeed, you reduce the damage. But if you fail, uh, you can either, you know, gain, uh, you know, all the damage remains the same. So you're a little bit injured and a little bit, you know, it's a bit more wearing so that when you come to the actual sort of big combat, which you're, you're going towards, you're not as well equipped as you think. So one of the examples he gives in his book, uh, Aaron's Christian's book, he talks about medicine checks. Because mm. a lot of the time we talk about medicine checks being, oh, are they dead? Uh, can I heal them? And you're like, okay, that's fine. That's, that's one way of doing it. But if you're like, okay, you're about to perform, uh, I think he talks about, you're about to perform some sort of surgery. You're about to sutra someone's arm. They're bleeding quite heavily. What do you do? And you ask them to describe it. And you're like, okay, we're going to say the, the, it's a medicine check and the DC is 13 or something, something like that. If they fail... It's not like, oh God, the arm has come off or anything like that. They just have to take a lot more time. And therefore, the next check they have to do, you know, it's just broken down this whole procedure into checks. And so the DC is raised or lowered as a result of how well you proceeded on the first one. And he talks about making almost like flow diagrams of like certain scenarios about like how, you know, how well did they do, how little did they do. And he always says it's much better to, you know, raise the DC is one way to do it. But he likes, you know, chipping off little blocks of, you know, hit points etc so that you know because they think oh it's fine i'll 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 have a rest at the top it's fine and then you are confronted by something and you're not you don't have your spells you don't have this you don't have that and it's just because you failed a couple of ch earlier checks which you thought were inconsequential so mm -hmm. that, yeah absolutely i love stuff like this where it's just like you know there's the possibility of dying outright for sure that's 3d6 uh when you put level one character can be quite tricky but yeah if, you, if there's enough people that have made enough successes you're gonna reduce the damage a little bit but you could have someone, uh, say, a particularly, um, let's say, not a glass cannon per se, like a warlock or, or even um, clerics. I can't remember. I can't remember which one has low armor class anymore. Um, but you, yeah, like they, they could have the power to do stuff. But then suddenly, oh God, they don't have enough hit points, and they're going to have to do something else or, or you know, hide behind things and, and really change their game plan as a result. Yeah, exactly. And this is really, yeah, it's a great way to get people involved and, and into that that mind frame, as you say, where you're kind of making things that influence other things. Consequence. Mm. Consequence is a really fun way of, you know, getting people involved in D&D &D and, you know, rewarding success, but getting them hooked by the failure as much as anything else. <laughs> Yeah, they make it through the storm, they, they have yeah. succeeded and failed and got damaged. What happens next? So, having burst through the storm clouds, the Celeste Noir takes 10 minutes to gather itself as the party can cast healing spells and definitely not take a short rest. Only mm -hmm. 10 minutes, so, you know, if they do that and just sit around, that's all fine. Until another familiar screech pierces the sky and they are attacked once again by pterodons, specifically four this time and ridden by halflings. So this is a slightly different encounter. This one actually introduces pterodons who have a flyby ability, mm -hmm. so being able to hit and then leave, but also ranged attacks against the party. So this is a very different sort of battle if, say, you've got your scale mailed fighter with your sword and shield but suddenly you've got a bow wielding spy that sort of shoots from you know a distance at you it's a little bit of an interesting encounter but mm, again the party are given the opportunity to flex their muscles a little bit save the crew once again 
and specifically the leader of these four halflings will surrender rather than trying to run or fighting to the death Mm. and they can capture her which gives the party the first sort of plot hook with a new character someone new that's been thrown in that doesn't start as a friend and yeah like it's one of those things where for me, it's quite different because when I first started in D&D, you, you go, you kill things, you know, and then someone might go, oh, wait, let's question them. And well, well, after you're about to do the killing blow, you're like, what? Oh, okay. And then it's, I think sometimes people, like, again, we've talked about this before many times, but like D&D does feel like a video game where you're just like, kill, 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 kill. We've, mm-hmm. we've cleared the dungeon. It's fine. But yeah, having someone, it's a bit like, um, I've mentioned this before on this, but uh, the monsters know what they're doing. But even like uh, minor characters know what they're doing. You know, they know when they've been beat. So that instantly, you know, you got to think about what is their intention? What is, you know, what is more important to them? Is it running away or is it surviving is it like you know what i'm beat i'd rather be captured and work with my options from there i like that just being able to introduce that and having someone that goes no please i I surrender and seeing if the players who again might not have played an rpg before or might not have uh, had this sort of encounter before they're like oh well i guess i guess we should we shouldn't kill them and Mm -hmm. having and because again like compared to killing say monsters who are inherently evil in in quotation marks to an actual person who's willing to talk to them and have a dialogue with them about depending on how secretive they are like obviously they'll make give some information but might be either persuaded or, or intimidated to give others both encounters are literally two or three pages worth of a4 and you could just expand on that you can create your own character stuff you just got to follow three or four bullet points for each sort of individual i guess yeah, exactly. And yeah, it, it's, it's good fun because for the first time you meet this other person, she's a halfling spy called a Getza Or. Yep. Again, great a name, or. fantastic. A Getza Or. It's or what? Oh, I bet, I bet that, that's her catchphrase. <laughs> yeah, or what? Um, but she, she surrenders. And actually, if the party do engage with her or, or talk to her, she's actually sort of helpful and freely gives a lot of information based on the fact that she commends the characters for their combat prowess you know like just give them a little bit of a little bit of flattery to ego boost yeah exactly so she tells them all about the fact that they are not the enemies they are mercenaries that were hired by who else but the kalashtar who Mm. have been hiring people to actually seek out the captain or not even the captain seeking out angelica Mm. um, and that they have been given quite advanced instructions and the party can then choose to sort of question the captain more she reveals more information about a very specific killing that maybe she may would have been part of years ago with this sort of individual group there is a wreckage below the ship which is Mm. quite an interesting one that the party can sort of help to sort of scour with a salvage arm that the ship mysteriously seems to have on it just appears from nowhere i like that exactly (laughs) but also uh, an artifact that's sort of brought up from the wrecked ship that angelica will sort of steal away very very conspicuously but then Mm. will not sort of talk about it or sort of says that it's an art object but apart from that it doesn't really give too much apart from the fact that it helps to fund her expedition but yeah there's lots of hooks lots of hooks thrown everywhere so by the end of this your party is now level two Mm -hmm. um they have their first stipend of gold they have introduced themselves to two different combat encounters. They've met the crew. They've got some suspicion, intrigue, and hopefully one thing more. So, right, was there any parts of these encounters that you weren't particularly keen on or you think, oh, I would change? Like, obviously, I know these are very, very sort of skeleton-esque type encounters. So, obviously, you would improve in them in some way, I would imagine. Yeah, you absolutely could. And I think they're deliberately skeleton to let people get to grips with them in a really easy way from a sort of beginner point of view. But I mean, you could say that having flying pterodons and both sort of encounters is perhaps a little repetitive. I'm sure they could have come up with something maybe a tad different. But seeing that, I, I quite like the way it sort of rounds off. I think they are very short. You couldn't really do one of these a week unless you had a very small meeting. Although maybe if you could only meet after school for or at lunchtime, for instance, that it would work quite well from that point of view. 
the the combat encounters, especially with the flyby actions, being able to get your head around mounted combats where the mm. mount moves and then the rider has to use their reaction to hold an action and then attack once the mount is yeah. there and then the mount will disengage. It can get a little bit complicated. So it does say you can safely ignore those rules if you want. And I would say you probably would have to if this is the first thing you're DMing because mm. it's a little bit weird to get your head around until you've run a few campaigns. But so yeah, I would say those are possibly the the things I would maybe think about. But but everything else that's sort of lacking in detail, it's yours to throw in. And yeah. more detail is given in the later weeks. So it does start to expand a little bit. Yeah, I think like, like exactly that. I think the only thing I would have quite liked is maybe, and it's just because we we've talked about it with um when we talked about the the ship combat and making the crew and stuff because obviously you're in the sky you have a ship yeah sure you've got mercenaries and stuff but maybe what i would do if it was if it maybe wasn't people necessarily starting at level one maybe i'd add a few more bits and pieces but i'd like the idea of using the ship positions as well that you've been hired to uh do certain stuff so maybe maybe not necessarily the the person who who, the helmsman of the ship but maybe a cook or a a medic or a a navigator all that sort of thing i'd quite like that uh, for player characters to do but anything to do with like maybe ship crew morale because i think that has always been like when we read about it i thought that was such an interesting concept that Mm. why wouldn't it apply to be on airship as well as uh, sea ships as well mm. so i think yeah i would maybe just include that from uh, the ghost of salt marsh and put that on there but otherwise yeah. yeah absolutely it's just it's straightforward enough you don't again it, it is what you get in it's, it is something that's been written 500 words or less every week so yeah absolutely and it's a it, it's supposed to be a way of getting into the game and, and and you can really jump into these you could read this in 20 minutes and then run a campaign or, or run a run a sort of encounter on it like it's, they are really easy to get into so yeah D and D beyond if you haven't looked at the encounters of the week definitely worth a try do you have any recommendations for similar things maybe with eberron or anything that you're like oh this feels very sort of like i don't know ships in the sky <laughs> Oh, that is a good question. I think I know there are books about flying ships because um, the oh. player in the campaign, Sam, talks yes. about them all the time. And I do oh. not know what it is. I've got I, I <laughs> completely forgotten what it is. But. I think the, the sort of things that I read are, are more about sort of age of sail and being able to sort of sail around on sailing boats. And I can give you a million one examples of that. But no, this is kind of, Ebron is deliberately a bit different, a bit steampunk, a bit um, mm. max in some ways. So it can, it, you can use it in that sort of sense, maybe make it a little more dystopian, a little bit more judge dread, maybe in the way that everybody's sort of a bit more policed and a bit more, you know, magic technology is used. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd love the idea that Judge Dredd just appears on a ship and goes, I am the law, surrounded <laughs> by uh, dinosaurs. Is that sugar? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I think the only thing I would think of, because again, you sort of briefly mentioned it, one of the biggest sort of elements in Eberron is the, the dragon marks, the indication that you are of a certain family that holds uh, certainly political power or, or some sort of authority because you have these additional skills. So, and that reminded me quite a lot of Game of Thrones, that you have these families, but you have, it skips, the power sort of skips generations when you have um, bastard children or, you know, this, that and the other. And that there's that sort of secrecy where people are trying to... Um, you know, hide their true intentions. Like, like I said, I feel like Angelica's clearly up to something, but you don't know what. You know, and even um, this, the the uh, I would call him Lysander Demetrius. Um, oh, that's probably what it is, Demetrius and Lysander. No, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I uh, just got that joke. Anyway, um, in, certainly in the first two encounters, there's very little on this person who has a mark of storms, which is actually you know an incredibly powerful thing to do. He's the one driving the ship. So again, that'd be quite cool to see what happens when two sort of houses are suddenly maybe at odds. And the other thing, again, going to sort of the the pterodons and stuff. So where have I seen pterodons? And I thought Jurassic Park, and I was like, no, that's that's silly. And that's then I thought. Well, but it's just one of those things. I was like, mm, where have I seen them where people have used them to fly mm. and stuff? And then I thought of um, Avatar, um, which is the uh, James Cameron film, I think 2011, where that you have a space marine, basically space Pocahontas, uh, <laughs> and they use they use big creatures to fly around and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And no, that's a good point, actually. I hadn't thought about Avatar. Yeah. And I normally think about Avatar a lot because it's a you- fantastic film. 
it's uh sure i mean i i prefer, brilliant poke, yeah poke on to see <laughs> <laughs> i actually saw avatar in the cinema four times yeah i saw it like two or three yeah yeah it was mad i just i think it was a couple of birthdays and then i saw it like by myself and then with family it just i can't want it to go it was brilliant i've not watched it recently so i don't know if it's if it holds up at all but i think just the whole story and you have sigourney weaver in it who's great the visuals look really good as well so yeah it's just all all about visuals yeah all about the visuals that's what everyone is about just describe the visuals describe a world that looks cool and is brightly colored and, and pretty and a bit mad and that's how people get involved and, and hooked. And you're a part of it all, so yeah. Exactly. If we wanted to go on from this, then, what have you got for me next time? What's What have you got up your sleeve? Uh, yes, yes, sorry. I, did, I, I have planned this because we're doing... Never mind. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've interrupted you. Sorry, did you want to say something else? No, I, no, I no, no, I, no. I'm utterly segued. No, I, I love a good segue, Ryan. I'm just... For some reason, my brain's only on 2% battery. I don't understand why. <laughs> anyway, so next time, I thought, you know what? I've actually not read that much about Eberron, you know? Obviously, we, we as a D&D group gave you Eberron, and I have it, but I've just never bothered to read it. And it, it's all the things I would love... So I was like, why don't we actually delve into some of the other sort of elements of it? Like what's new with Eberron or what's been sort of like canonized? I don't know if that's a word, but mm. like sort of gone, these things are now, you can now use them because we have play tested them and you don't have to like scurry on forums or anything like that, trying to put together sure. your own custom things. So we're going to look at four of the sort of new races that have been sort of introduced, I think, into Eberron. So we've got Changelings, Kalashtar, Shifters and Warforged. So we'll be looking at those in a little bit more detail next time brilliant but they're all really cool like there's a couple of those i really really like the sound of and would absolutely definitely play so yeah, yeah. really cool so ryan is there anything you would like to plug any anything you're up to anything you're like that's really cool other people should know about it well i think if your brain is on two percent i really should plug it in at some point i keep forgetting to bring the charger is that <laughs> You see, like, I can actually see Fiona's face right now, and she is pained, absolutely pained by that joke. I, you should come find me on YouTube. I, my name is Ursa Ryan. I, I love talking to people, especially on Discord. So come find me on Discord. We'll have a chat about D&D and other things. And I, my name is Fiona. I run the What Am I Rolling podcast, a twice-monthly RPG podcast. Um, it's going very well. I was telling... Well, it was going very well. I was telling Ryan that I've it's lost... It's going very well. Oh, yeah, but then, as I was telling you before, Ryan, I've lost an edit that took me five days to do because I pressed delete. Oh, so no. I, it's... It's really painful when that happens. Yeah, we're both, both of us as creators are like, ah, as inside. But it's fine because, we, you know, I just have to redo it all again in a slightly shorter time frame. I love a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> oh god yeah god i've done that before it's mm-hmm. terrible isn't it you spend hours and hours of editing and normally to the sound of your own voice which is really painful at the best of times mm-hmm. and then you delete it yeah Ugh. Ugh. yeah <laughs> sucking teeth that sounds awful Ugh. anyway until next time friends we will hear no speak i don't know <laughs> how do we end we this will. we will bye bye oh. bye Ha 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 ha!